So let's go ahead and get this started. So um, welcome. It's a buggy world managing insects in your landscape. So just a quick overview, um, you know, what is extension? Well, one thing, a lot of people say, I've never heard of extension, but if you've heard of 4-H, or if you've heard of the Master Gardener program, then you've, you know extension, but just not directly. So extension is a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida, and the USDA. So what we do is we take the resources and the research, the science-backed research from those entities, and we, you know, we distribute it, out to our local communities um, through community initiatives, classes, outreach, and also volunteer opportunities. So we have a lot of different um, volunteer opportunities, a ton of them. Um, again, this is all science-backed information. So a lot of times, like when I'm doing my biorational pesticides, people say, oh, I've heard about you can do, you know, make mix this up. Well, I can't tell you one way or another if that's gonna work because there's not really any scientific data behind it. But um, if something works for you, great. As long as it's not um, harmful to you and harmful to the environment, I say go for it. So I am just one. So here I am, chemicals in the environment. And actually my, I really, um, my title kind of is all encompassing. I'm the only chemicals in the environment agent in the state of Florida. Um, so I don't have a, a sidekick to go to when I have programs. But I, here in the, um, at you know, our extension, we have many, many agents and specialists, a county uh, specialist. So um, anything that you are interested in, whether it's manatees, sharks, uh, water conservation, composting, um, nutrition, cooking, it is at our extension office. So I'm sure you found a bunch of those on Eventbrite. So um, keep going on here. So just an overview of our program today, and I apologize for talking fast, but I have a lot of slides and I wanna make sure I get through them. So um, we're gonna just do a quick overview of insects, what their characteristics are and their life cycle, their insect feeding strategies. Um, we'll discuss representatives, just representatives of the most common species that are found in the landscape, okay? So these are just generalizations. And when I talk about the insects, it's the general overview of them. Of course, there's always gonna be that, insects that insect that is an outlier, but these are all the uh, general you know, overview. So I'll um, also give an overview of beneficial insects and then a very brief introduction in, into integrated pest management as well as biorational pesticides. But again, that's a whole other class. So um, I won't dive into that, you know, do a deep dive into that. Okay, so just to start. So insects rule the world. So in the world, there's approximately 30 million described species. So that's ones they've actually found out. In the U.S., we have about 91,000 species, but they estimate there's about probably 70 to 75,000 that are yet to be discovered. So, you know, they're constantly discovering new species almost daily. So the fossil record shows that um, insects came on land um, about 325 million years ago, but they were kind of latecomers um, as the arachnids were already here. So um, they're already, or arthropods were already here. So spiders, scorpions, mites, um, myropods, which are our centipedes and our millipedes. So they were already here. But the oldest confirmed insect fossil um, has been estimated about 385 million years ago. Most people are gonna think that's a cockroach, right? <laughs> we all think that the cockroaches are the dinosaurs of the insect world, but it's actually not. Um, the, the oldest described species is um, the silverfish, or, or it was a silverfish-like insect. So silverfish are those little things that run through your bathroom. Um, they're, they're silver, they have two long tail filaments, um, they're really quick. And they also, or you find them in your cardboard um, your boxes in your garage. You'll also find them in book bindings. So that's what a silverfish is. So thinking of that 30 million species, um, it's estimated about, there's about 2 billion insects for every person on, on earth. So when we say insects rule the world, they really do rule the world. Um, and also insects, when we talk about them, you know, we all kind of think, you know, we have good insects and we have bad insects really only about 1% of those are considered pest insects or bad insects. They're either serious to us, they're occasional you know, pest insects, or they're a sporadic pest insect in the urban environment or, or in our um, ag world. 99% of insects are good. So they either feed on other insects, um, they serve as food for other insects or wildlife, 
and they also help to recycle plant and animal matter, right? And also the big thing is they pollinate our crops. So we know the vast majority of insects are beneficial or benign, um, as we'll, we'll see today. So like cockroaches, back to cockroaches. Most people hate cockroaches, but actually cockroaches can, can be a real pest when they invade our homes, right? But out in the landscape, um, they're detritivores. So they're important contributors to help break down uh, organic matter and the recycling of that organic matter. Cockroaches are also a main food source for a lot of other insects, small mammals and reptiles, right? Um, I apologize, the, the, all the lawnmowers are happening today. So, so people are uncertain of insects because they don't realize their ecological value or the importance of their life stages. And I say that because many insects have immature stages that are extremely beneficial in helping control pest insects. So if you don't understand this cycle, or you can't identify an immature insect, um, you may automatically think that it's harming your plant because you see this strange looking insect, right? And you see a some damage, whether it's a sucking damage or it's a chewing damage. And so you automatically think that's a pest insect and you might, you might try to you know, minimize the damage and you, you spray a, a pesticide on there. Well, that immature stage may actually be a beneficial and what it's doing, it's actually eating the insects that are causing the damage. So, you know, understanding proper ID of, of an insect is really important. So knowing the life stages, right? Knowing what the immatures look like as well as what the adult looks like. So to pesticides, um, pesticides are a problem because when we use them to control insects, although well-meaning, um, we don't understand the impact that pesticides can have on beneficials, right? And they end up doing more long-term damage by using certain conventional chemicals. Now, I am not against chemicals. Um, you know, I, I worked for an agrochemical company for 12 years. I appreciate the time I spent there, but I also got a, a better understanding of, of the um, categories of, of insecticides and pesticides in general. Um, and what biorationals can do. So um, I'm against improper overuse of pesticides, right? And not using the proper pesticide when you need it, right? So, so again, I'm not against conventional chemicals. I just know there's, there's a time and a place for them and it's usually at the very end, so. So we're surrounded and outnumbered by bugs in Florida. So most of them are our allies. So let's give bugs a break is what I say. <laughs> So um, insects are successful, so why are they? So constant reproduction. They can reproduce a large number of offspring really quickly and many of them have multiple generations in one season. So in summer, you know, like aphids can reproduce over and over again. Um, this is also the reason that pesticide resistance is such a problem in ins insects. Because if you spray the insect with the same pesticide over and over again, the same class of insecticide, then you're hitting multiple generations, but those generations then are building up insect resistance. So that, is, that can be a problem. Camouflage. Camouflage allows them, allows them to blend really well into their environment and they go undetected. Insects tend to hide underneath leaves or on the, the stem of the plant and their coloration is hard to see and they're tiny. Um, so camouflage is really good for them. Um, they have this protective outer shell that's called an exoskeleton. So this helps them keep moisture inside of their body. It's also, the exoskeleton is also their point of uh, muscle attachment. So for their small bodies, they can actually be pretty strong, as you can see, like for an ant, right? Um, so they're small and they can fly. So this small size allows them um, the ability to fly their small size and their and the fact that they can fly allows them ability to escape into small areas um, and get into areas that others couldn't, couldn't be, but also allows them to disperse to new areas, right? So, um, you know, certain, again, back to the aphid, certain insects only have wings at certain time, like aphids have wings during usually the fall where the females then can, can disperse and, and, you know, settle in new areas. So in Florida, we have about 15,000 native inverts, so invertebrates, and about 1,500 endemic inverts. So endemic means ones that were here to begin with and have been here forever and aren't, and aren't found anywhere else. 
the native means they may be in other areas, but they've basically established here and now we're con they're considered um, native. So um, Florida, we have, we are the insect capital of, of the world. So they're in the phylum Arthropoda and the class Insecta. So common characteristics of them, and I'm just gonna to touch on these quickly. So um, they have three body parts. So they have a head, they have a thorax, and they have an abdomen. So three body parts. A spider, spider is arachnid. It's in the phylum Arthropoda, Arthropoda but it's an arachnid, only has two body parts. So all insects have three body parts they have this exoskeleton. And again, the exoskeleton is, is the places for attachment. And when you're looking at, at an insect, um, the thorax is where it is considered their locomotion. So this is where all of their, their wings are attached and this is where their legs are attached as well. The head is, is for the sensories, right? And then the abdomen is, is for their reproductive and their, their systems working. So, um, the thing about the exoskeleton, um, it's a real advantage because it helps them, you know, maintain that moisture. Um, and the exoskeleton is actually made of more, more of chitin, so it's more like our fingernails than it is than our bones. Um, the disadvantage to an exoskeleton is when they have to molt, and it's the immature stages that molt because once they're an adult, they don't need to get any bigger. But the immatures, basically like our babies, need to grow, right? So they, as they grow, because the exoskeleton keeps them in one, at one size, they break through their exoskeleton as they grow. So a lot of them go anywhere between four to six molts, which are called instars, as they're growing up. So um, as they molt, right after they molt, and sometimes you'll say, oh, I saw an albino insect. Well, that's actually the, an insect that has just molted. So they're white. That exoskeleton hasn't hardened and it hasn't darkened yet. So when you see a white insect, they had just molted and that's when they're most vulnerable to predation, right? So to other insects or other, other mammals um, or reptiles, um, they're most apt to go through desiccation at that time. But this is also a good time for if you are using chemical because they have no outer shell. So anything that comes in contact with them really hurts that insect at that point. It only takes an insect a couple hours to actually have that, that exoskeleton molt or, or harden and, and be, a, you know, be a, a, an exoskeleton. So, um, so they do have paired jointed legs. So they have three pair of, of legs. They have digestive, circulatory, and nervous system, um, not identical to us, but, but similar. And they either breathe through gills, tracheal, or sphericals. So they don't have noses like we do. Insects have, their, they breathe through these sphericals that are down the side of their abdomen. So you see these little dots around the side of the abdomen? Those are, those are the, where the, how they breathe. Those are their sphericals. So you can take an insect, like, you know, a lot of times you see this with cockroaches, turn it upside down in a, in a glass of water, it can stay alive. It's not going to drown as long as its abdomen is sticking out of the water. So it's going to die because it stops, it's no longer able to feed, right? It's the same if you cut off a, a cockroach head. They still can maintain, um, <laughs> it's kind of gross, but they can still maintain, you know, their viability until they either desiccate or they start to death. They can live, I think, up to over a week without their head. So insect growth and development. This is really important. And sorry, again, he's right outside my window. Um, insect growth development, really important in understanding the way insects grow from their egg stage to the adult, especially when it comes to um, trying to treat them, figuring out how to treat them, um, you know, to apply insecticides, whether it's biorationals or, or conventional. There are two different ways they, um, they grow. So there's complete and there's incomplete metamorphosis. So that just describes how they grow from the egg to the, the adult. So we'll start with incomplete. So incomplete has three stages of growth. So they go, they go the egg to the nymph to the adult, right? So egg, nymph, adult. And the nymphs look Basically, they're little mini-me's. They look just like the adult. They may be a little bit different color, but if you looked at it, you go, this is a chinch bug, right? So you know that this is a chinch bug because it looks like the adult. 
Um, they don't have wings. The only stage of an insect that has wings is the adult. But the nymph stage is going to have wing buds. So as it gets bigger, you're going to see that wing bud. And there's going to be some examples of that as we go along. So a few of the incomplete metamorphosis, right, three stages of, of growth are things like cockroaches, crickets, chinch bugs, uh, mole crickets, and grasshoppers. All those are incomplete metamorphosis. The other thing about incomplete is the adult and the, and the nymph eat the same thing. So chinch bugs are gonna feed on the leaf blade of your grass, right? Same with grasshoppers. Um, so anything that's incomplete, they tend to eat the same thing as the adult. Cockroaches are a little bit different because um, the incomplete or the, the nymph stages um, actually feed on the adult's fecal matter. So um, that's a little bit different, but, um, but they do look just like the adult. So complete metamorphosis has four stages. So we have egg, we have the larval stage, right? So these are nymphs, these are larvae, the larval stage, the pupa stage, and then the adult. So four stages. And in this, Again, they also go through these, these molts, right? So the, the larval stage goes through the, these molts until they hit the pupal stage. So this pupa stage has stopped feeding. It kind of gets stationary, and it does. It gets stationary, and what this stage is now, it's kind of gone into this, like, this little, um, basically a sleep pattern, sort of, and it's transitioning into the adult stage. For complete metamorphosis, the larval stage looks nothing like the adult. So how I remember it is that the larvae or the immature is completely different looking than the adult. So that's the way I remember complete versus incomplete when it's, you know, it's just one of those things I have to think of quickly. So we know some of the insects in this state in, in this category as complete metamorphosis are things like butterflies and moss, lady beetles, right, ladybugs, beetles and lacewing. Um, a lot of our beneficial insects are in this complete uh, metamorphosis stage and these tend to be more successful as well like just in general because the the larval of the immature stage does not eat the same thing as the adult right so we know like take a butterfly for instance right the larval stage of a butterfly is a caterpillar and it chews on leaves right it eats leaves of different plants Whereas the butterfly takes nectar and, and, and like sometimes takes pollen as well. Well, bees take pollen, but um, butterflies take nectar. So they eat something completely different. So if you're trying to target something like this, I hope you never want to target a butterfly, but um, if you're targeting some immature stage, just know that they eat things completely different than the adult. So sometimes it's also hard to target those two stages together. So Karen, if anything, um, if anybody has questions, just you can just interrupt me because I'm going to just keep talking. <laughs> so um, now we're going to get into, so we just talked about incomplete and complete metamorphosis, um, their strategies. Um, now we're going to talk about the feeding strategies. So there are two, again, this is general, general categories, right? <clears throat> there are two distinct categories to our insects on how to figure out what you have on your plant outside. <clears throat> so we have insects with piercing sucking mouth parts, and then we have insects with chewing mouth parts. So, you know, we talk about 99% of these insects in our landscape are beneficial, but darn, if we go outside, we kind of think it's the opposite, right? Because there always seems to be something chewing on our, on our plant, or there's some sooty mold or something, your plant just looks weird. So, um, but just remember, 99% of the insects are, are, are good insects. So um, insects with these piercing sucky mouth parts are things like mites, aphid scale, mealybug, thrips. Um, those all have uh, piercing sucky mouth parts, but thrips actually have their piercing sucking rasping mouth part. It's the only one that has this rasping mouth part. So what it does, it'll take and it, it'll scrape the leaf and then it'll decide whether it likes the taste and then it will pierce the, the, the leaf. So um, the damage of thrips looks different than damage from like spider mite, but we'll, we'll get into that. 
And then insects with chewy mouth parts are things like caterpillars, grasshoppers, beetles, and mole crickets. So um, we'll, we'll go through both of these um, in just a second. So um, we tend not to see the insects, um, but we see the damage that they cause, right? Most of the time you're gonna walk right by your plant and have no idea until all of a sudden you see half your, your leaves are eaten or they, they're discolored or there's some sooty mold sitting on it. So most of the time we don't see the insects because insects are tiny. You know, you know, not talking about lovers that are like three inches long, but majority of the insects are tiny. They're less than a half inch long. So many of them are between like a 16th and an eighth of an inch. So we're talking small. So piercing sucking insects have specialized mouth parts that have a stylet. Let me go back here. This is a stylet right here. So it's, it's like a hollow tube and it, it's the thing that pierces into the plant and sucks the plant juice out. So um, <clears throat> the stylet on some insects can be anywhere from half the body length to two thirds the body length. So it goes underneath the insect and that can, you know, if the insect's this big, that stylet can be this big. So um, it's, it's pretty amazing. The thing with um, piercing, in, piercing sucking insects is that they're more problematic for us and you know, they, they are pest insects because piercing sucking insects transmit, have the potential to transmit diseases to plants and then also between plants. So that's why we have to watch out for our piercing sucking insects. You know, we think about white fly, a lot of them, you know, white fly is notorious for, for quite a few diseases on tomatoes. So um, aphids also uh, transmit a lot of diseases. So piercing sucking is really the one we have to, to, to think about. Now, just as a side note, so the number one deadliest insect in the world has a piercing sucking mouth part. So um, I have it in one of my classes. <laughs> so um, it is the mosquito. So it is a piercing sucking insect, but it's not piercing, it's not piercing your plant, it's piercing you, right? Um, thing about mosquitoes, they actually are somewhat of a pollinator because the adults actually eat pollen. Um, or, or nectar to, to uh, feed themselves. It was, it's only the female that takes blood. But just wanted to throw that in because that is another one of my programs. So when you talk about damage, so I wanted to get to this. Um, oh, let me get over here. So feeding damage is usually seen before the insects. So I talked about that. So white fly, spider mite, and thrips damage, and lace bug, but I don't have a picture of lace bug damage here, all looks very similar, right? So um, you're gonna get the stippling kind of effect. Um, spider mites, you tend to get some, some, you will get webbing. And then thrips, you get kinds of, kind of a bronzing color. So you'll get this bronzing. So when you're seeing this type of damage, you kind of go, okay, I know I can at least narrow it down to, I have white fly spider mites, thrips, or, or lace bug, right? So mealybug, mealybug and, um, and scale has very similar looking looking damage. So the mealybug almost always causes kind of this this cottony cushion kind of build up. It's like a it, it looks like a bunch of cotton. So that's kind of a generalization of mealybugs. You'll see that that uh, that build up especially at the at the nodes of the, of the between the branches. Um, and then some of the the scales and the mealybugs actually look very similar. So this is cycad scale but this is, this is a, a coconut mealybug. So um, again, they also, they can look very similar too. Now, sooty mold is actually not damage on the plant, nor is it directly caused by the insect. Sooty mold is actually caused indirectly through the honeydew that these sucking piercing insects um, create. So um, I'll get into sooty mold in a second, but I just wanted you to know that You'll see this and you'll think it's damaged, but it's not, but it's an indicator that you do have a pretty big infestation of those insects. So um, sooty mold, again, like it doesn't, it, it won't hurt that plant initially, but it can um, stop it from photosynthesizing. So we know photosynthesis actually, through photosynthesis is how the plant actually feeds itself. So it will, uh, it will affect its, its ability to grow and its vigor, right? So it's not gonna like get bigger and, and do great if it has a lot of sooty mold on it. Okay, so let's get into our insects. So we're gonna go through the insects with piercing sucking mouth parts first. So we have our, our arm
armored scales, which we have our, our armored and soft scales. I'm gonna talk about armored first because they're a special case. They're different than all the other piercing sucking insects. We'll go through mealybugs. So here's, here's your armored scale. Here's a soft scale, it's Florida wax scale. Here's our mealybugs. We'll talk about aphids. Um, this is a white fly. This is two spotted spider mite, which is not an insect. Um, the chinch bug, if you've never seen a chinch bug, this is what the, the um, immature stages of a chinch bug look like. And this, these are thrips. So we'll talk about all of these. <clears throat> okay, sooty mold. So I, I've already told you about sooty mold. This is what sooty mold looks like up close. This is Florida wax scale. Um, what happens again, it, the, this wax scale is going to produce a honeydew, which is a very sticky, sugary substance. And so this sooty mold loves that. And so that sooty mold is going to grow on top of that, that um, sugary substance. This is really easy to get off. You can either spray it with um, a soap solution, like wet it down with that soap solution and then give it a, a spray afterwards, or you can just wet it let it sit for a while and then come back and, and spray it off again. And then you can get the majority of that sooty mold off. Again, it's not directly affecting your plant, but it will if it covers most of your plant. Okay, remember, I, we'll talk about armored scales first. So the thing about armored scales is that um, they build the shell, but the shell is separate from the body. So what you can do, so these are all, this is Florida red scale. What you could do is actually take a little, a little probe or your fingernail, stick it underneath the shell and try to pop it off. And you can pop off this shell and that insect is still gonna be sitting there, right? The thing about the, the, the difference, so that's one of the difference um, is that they have that shell is separate than the body, but they pierce individual cells in the plant so they don't create honeydew. So, Armored scales do not produce honeydew. So if you don't have honeydew, you're not gonna have sooty mold. So I'm one, I don't know all my scales, and I'll be honest about that, but I do know what a scale looks like, and I can tell whether it's an armored scale or a soft scale, depending on if there's honeydew present, I mean, if there's sooty mold present. So in this case, there is no sooty mold, so I know this is gonna be an armored scale. So here we, again, this is Florida red scale, and this is a tea tree scale. The control for armored scales is using either uh, horticultural oils work best or neem oils. So the oils work best against the armored scale adult version. Um, remember we say that there's an immature version of, of all insects, and the immature versions of both the, the armored and the soft scale are called crawlers. Those are little tiny insects that crawl around and um, you can use soap or oil against those. I'll get into that in a minute, but as far as the armored scale adult, horticulture oils or neem oils work best. The other thing about these armored scales is that once they start piercing, they don't really move. Um, so they'll pierce that plant and they're gonna stay in one place. So they actually start to like their, their legs start to basically like uh, digress and they go away. So this scale is going to stay there even after that insect's dead. The only way you're going to know if this is dead is if you try to blast it off with water or if you take and you can run your finger down the side and if it just crumbles down you know all those those scales are dead. So that's one thing about armored scale. So this is just a couple of the, this is Asian cy cycad scale. Um, it looks somewhat like the false, false oleander scale but we know a lot of our palms get this. So this is, um, it's really important to get these infestations when they're early um, and you can control them when they're, when they're young. But here, um, these are eggs. I'm trying to see if there's a crawler. Um, these are crawlers up here. So you can see these are crawlers and these are eggs here. Okay, honeydew and insects that produce it. So okay, remember armored scales, I said that's a whole different whole different type of piercing second insect that because they don't produce honeydew. So honeydew, it's a clear sticky liquid that's excreted um, by all the other ones. And basically honeydew is sugary insect poop, kind of how you can think of it. So um, again, it's sticky, it's shiny. You might notice that first on your plant 
And that means that's a pretty early infestation as well because the sooty mold hasn't come in, but you can start trying to see if you can treat at that stage. And a treating means you can blast it with water to blast those insects off. Because like here, here's an aphid. If you blast this, this aphid off with a blast of water, you basically have broke its mouth part off. Its mouth part is still sitting in that plant. That aphid may still be alive and it may get on the ground, it may be able to crawl back up on your plant, but it's not gonna be able to feed because it no longer has a mouth part. So basically it's like a walking dead. So um, that's, that's one way you can get things off without the use of pesticides. So soft scales, mealybugs, aphids, whiteflies all produce honeydew, so they, that sooty mold is going to be um, associated with them. So soft scale, they're different from arbored scale. So again, like if I looked at this, this Florida wax scale, I would automatically go, oh, that must be an arbored scale because it's got a really big shell, right? That, that covering is really big. But the thing is, it also produces that shell, but is actually part of, of that insect. So it stays attached to that insect. So if you try to, to you know, turn this upside down, you're gonna pull that entire insect off that plant. They do stay mobile. So um, although they like to stay in place, they can get up and move around. So um, adult insect, or the, 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 um, the soft scales do move around. Again, their immature stage is also called a crawler. Um, this is probably a second or third instar, but the crawlers have no, no coloration to their back. They're just a soft, um, kind of a yellowish color. And those are the easiest to target with things like, like um, either soaps or oils. Um, but for soft scale, insecticidal soaps work better. And I'll, get it, I'll, I'll give you a little thing about that on how to remember that. So um, here is the soft brown scale. We'll see this a lot, um, tulip tree scale, and then this is the Florida wax scale. These are all really common here in Florida. So these are the three S's. This is the way you remember what works best for what. So you know we have, okay, you're going, okay, sh did she say was it whore oil or was it insecticidal soap? I don't remember. So the three S's, think three S. So soft scale, so there's your first step, S, soft scale, produces sooty mold, right? Because soft scale produces honeydew, so sooty mold is associated with it. And so insecticidal soaps work better. So soft scale, sooty mold, insecticidal soap. That's the best for, for your soft scales. Again, your armored scales, the hort oils work best, and your neem oils. And then the crawlers, for either of those soft or armored scales, your hort oils or your insecticidal soaps will work. One caveat about oils, especially right now in, in summer in Florida, it's hot, it's humid. You spray oil in the middle of the day, you are gonna fry your plant. You're gonna defoliate it. You're not gonna kill it, but you are gonna injure your plant. So oils are best left during cooler seasons, right? So the beginning of our summer maybe and the end of our summer, if you have to use them during the summer, spray them really early in the morning or spray them later in the afternoon. So do not spray them in the heat of the day. That will also be stated on the label. So um, always read your label. <laughs> so these are a couple of the soft scale, I won't get into it, or, or one. This is the cottony cushion. This kind of, I think this is coolest, one of the coolest looking of the, of the scales. Um, these are mainly found on woody ornamentals and citrus. So um, that's just, just an example of one of the soft scales. So moving on to mealybug. So mealybug is actually, a, it's a type of a scale. It's just a soft bodied scale and it moves around. So it's an insect that is constantly moving around, but still it's got a piercing sucking in uh, mouth part. It doesn't have a shell. It does produce sooty mold. I mean, it does produce honeydew. So there is sooty mold associated with it and all stages are mobile. So this is the crawler stage. So this one just hatched out. This is probably a third instar, so this is probably the third time it's molted, and then this is an adult. This is maybe, I think, Madeira mealybug. This is a long tail mealybug. Um, this is probably pink hibiscus mealybug. And then I'm not sure which one this one is, but um, there are all kinds. And again, remember I, I was talking about how they have this like buildup, there's a kind of a co cotton looking stuff to it. So if you actually try to like tear through this cotton material, you'll find a mass of eggs. So the females kind of, uh, they're kind of gregarious and they'll get together and they lay all their egg cases together, um, safety in numbers sort of, but also insecticides, trying to try to pierce that 
um, that cottony material, either what, if it is with uh, insecticidal soaps or even conventional, sometimes it's really hard to get through. If you have an infestation that's, that's this big, I would suggest you trim off that bush. You bag it into a plastic bag and you throw it in your garbage. Do not put anything into your compost because those insects are gonna just climb out of your compost and go reinfest whatever's near your compost, right? So never, never, never put infested material into your compost. It always goes into your garbage. So pink hibiscus mealybug. This is one of this is what I first started working on. I worked for the USDA for a few years when I first moved to Florida. Um, pink hibiscus mealybug came in and they thought it was going to, you know, end this the the uh, um, you know our landscape uh, you know um, business, but it didn't. It's actually pretty easy to to uh, take care of. Pink hibiscus, it loves hibiscus, but it gets on a whole bunch of different, uh, um, different uh, plants, but it causes kind of like this cabbage head look to the, to the uh, hibiscus plant. When you start seeing this, because that piercing sucking actually modifies or, or changes the dynamic of the plant itself, you're never going to have a big, beautiful hibiscus bloom on that. So your best bet, again, just, you know, trim off this, time to trim this off bag it, throw it away, allow that branch to then, you know, reproduce, you know, come back and then produce your big, beautiful hibiscus bloom that you are expecting from that bush. But this will never come back and will never have a, a it might get a bud on it, but it's just going to fall off. So on to aphids. So aphids have this pear-shaped body. Um, their colors can change. I mean, well, one, there's over 100 different species of, of aphids in Florida. They're all different colors. We have the oleander aphid is this really cool orange colored. The green peach aphid is this kind of limey green. Um, but that's early season. By the end of the season in fall, these look more like the bean aphid. So um, their coloration can change. So um, Aphids usually show up early in the spring when we get fresh flush, right? So our, our plants have just flushed out. They have that real tender, soft tissue. Aphids love that. They also love when we've fertilized our plant because they love that nitrogen-rich um, uh, tissue. So you're going to find aphids, and they are going to just, like, propagate like crazy. So um, females reproduce asexually right? And they give birth to live young early in the spring. So this female just produced these live young. So she can pop out, um, she, well, first she lives for about 25 days. She can give birth up to 100 young in that 25 days. This young within one week is going to be a reproductive female. So your population can get out of control really quick if left unchecked, but aphids truly are kind of like our chocolate of the insect world. So almost everything eats aphid. So if you have natural predators, right, uh, you know, beneficials in your, in your landscape, they're going to go right to these aphids, especially ladybugs, lacewing, um, uh, hoverflies, um, parasitic wasps. So a lot of different things eat these aphids. So um, <clears throat> there are certain things like you see here, this is an aphid mummy, right? So this is called an aphid mummy. What has happened is a parasitic wasp has come and has pierced that aphid, laid an egg inside that aphid, and that, that wasp egg, once it hatched, it then ate the inside of that aphid and then emerged. So if you, if you looked at this whole aphid you know, population here and you said, oh my gosh, I need to spray, I need to treat you know, with insecticide, because there's a lot of aphids, you would actually be killing a lot of, par of parasitic, a lot of your beneficial, your natural predators. Because what's happened is this wasp, like here are three right here, mummies, that parasitic wasp has already emerged. So the fact that you know that has that already emerged, most of these are probably walking dead, right? A lot of these already have a parasitic wasp inside of them feeding on them while they're still alive. So if you sprayed and killed those aphids right now, you would be you would be killing that next generation of those parasitic wasps that are helping you control that overall population of, of aphids. Okay, so see how that works. <laughs> so um, if you see these in your landscape, do not treat that that um, aphid population. So this is just some of the damage. Um, like again, here you see this probably happened within a few days. 
um, it, they can really um, take over very quickly. Come on. Um, so on to whitefly. So again, we're still on sucking piercing insects. So whitefly. Um, this is a silver leaf whitefly. It's also called the sweet potato whitefly. They vector a lot of different diseases. Whitefly can get out of control really quickly, so you need to make sure you, you check for whitefly. These are the nymph stages of the whitefly. And so whitefly are, are um, they, they are a, a complete metamorphosis. So this is the pupa stage, also called the, the red eye stage. Um, all of these are underneath the leaf, but the pupa stage uh, is non-feeding. So this basically has, has gone into a, a sleep type situation and is getting ready to, to emerge out into, a, into an adult. You can figure out if you have a white fly as you walk by your, your plant, you kind of tap on it. If you see this little puff of white that comes off the plant and then goes back onto the plant really quick, that's a white fly. The adults do not like to fly. They like to stay put. But if they're disturbed, they'll get off the plant and they go right back on. So that's a really easy way to, to figure out whether you have white fly. Again, they can cause serious damage. Um, if you're treating with, with biologicals, so this insecticidal soaps really work really well against these if you treat the infestation early, right? There are also a lot of natural enemies, uh, natural controls to these white fly, but again, because they do transmit diseases, um, a lot of them, and if you have landscape and you have a garden, I would really keep your white fly in check. So. Um, Again, you need to look underneath the leaf to find these, these immatures. So this is the uh, Rugo spiraling whitefly. Um, it's also called the gumbo limbo whitefly, but there's also a different whitefly that's called the ficus whitefly. So um, ficus whitefly is mostly found on ficus and uh, weeping fig. All can, also can be found on like banyan trees, um, the Cuban laurel, strangling fig, and fiddle leaf fig. So, um, Ficus hedges are highly susceptible to this ficus whitefly. So when the ficus whitefly came in, if you've ever been down in Miami-Dade area, um, you see these amazing ficus hedges. They, you know, they use them as, as, as like retaining, not retaining walls, but as uh, um, privacy walls, right? Beautiful, beautiful ficus hedges. Well, when this ficus whitefly came in, it decimated a lot of these hedges because they didn't understand or how to control this ficus whitefly. So, um, it really decimated a lot of these, these, uh, these hedges. So it's really unfortunate. Um, we've, we started seeing it up here as well. But here's another thing. When you have a monoculture in your landscape, so if you have one plant, say you love hibiscus, right? So you only have hibiscus in your land or in your landscape, or you only have ficus. Just know if you have something that's a, a, a plant that's susceptible to a certain insect or multiple of insects like that, you're gonna have a real problem and you're gonna be constantly fighting. So diversity is security. Diversity in your landscape is really, really important because if you do have one of those plants or three of those plants in your, your, in your landscape, you know that maybe your other plants are gonna be able to, um, to overcome and help you in keeping those infestations down. Plus those other plants may also be um, resting spots or harborages for, for your beneficial insects. So diversity, diversity, diversify, make sure you have a real variety of plants in your landscape. And that's a real, that's, that's, a, that's how you have a successful landscape. And you're not gonna be you know, constantly battling your insects. So we'll just get caught up here. We've gone over the scales, we've gone over the mealybug, aphids, and whiteflies. So now we'll move on to our two spotted spider mites, our chinch bugs and our thrips, because these are all kind of a little bit different. So two spotted spider mite. So mite damage is more severe in hot and dry weather. So remember that when it's hot, when it's dry, you might see an explosion of spider mites. Once spider mites take control, they're really hard to, to control or to eliminate. So I know we're talking about these spider mites as if they're insects, but they're not right? They're an arthropod, but they are related to insects and ticks. They are true mites. So if you're going out and you're going to use, trying to use an, an insecticide against spider mites, it's not going to work because they're not an insect. You need to use specific miticides. 
if you're going to get to the conventional chemicals, miticides are what you need. Um, but again, these you, there are some bioirrationals that you can use against spider mites, but there are also quite a few natural enemies of spider mites. So as you look at here, these are the spider mites. So this guy certainly is a spider, right? Or, or a mite, a spider mite, but it is not a two-spotted spider mite. So what this is, this is a predatory mite. This is called persimilis. This guy is voracious on spider mites. Actually, that's the only thing he eats or it eats. So it will run around and you can tell one, they look very different. They're a lot quicker than spider mites. Um, they'll run across your leaf and you're like, what the heck was that? That's a persimilis or, or a, another one. There's quite a few of the, the predatory mites that eat spider mites, but the persimilis is the one that only eats spider mites. So as soon as all these spider mites are gone, this, this mite is gonna die because that is its only food source. The other ones will eat um, other soft-bodied insects. Some of them actually even eat dust or pollen to stay alive long enough for them to find other, other prey. So um, really good to have predatory mites in your, in your landscape. And there are a lot that are, are native to Florida. So spider mite damage is called stippling. So you'll start seeing these like little dots all over your plant usually goes up the, the veins, but can be throughout the plant. So, um, you know, this is just something to look for also. I mean, I think my next one is, yes, webbing. So once you start seeing webbing like this, time to trim off that plant, definitely put that in a plastic bag and toss it because um, there is nothing that is gonna save this plant because those spider mites are all over that plant now and nothing really penetrates that web. It's really, really difficult to penetrate that web. So just trim off that plant so it doesn't, they don't move to another plant, right? So trim off that plant and you're good to go. So thrips, thrips are the one that has, right? The sucking piercing, but also has a raspy mouth part. They scrape the top of the leaf and decide if they want to taste, if it tastes good, and then they'll start feeding. They're very, very mobile. So they'll move throughout the plant. They especially like to be inside the flowers. So they'll get this bronzing color. Let me get my cursor, won't go away. Um, they'll get this bronzing color. And as it, that dries, it'll get bronze and it'll get crisp. And then it'll start making holes in the leaf because that leaf just, just dies, that part of the leaf dies. It also causes their fecal matter are black specks. This is, these smaller black specks are probably thrip or thrips, but these larger black spots are probably lace bug. You see this a lot on avocado. Avocado lace bug is notorious and has this big black globby tar look like a fecal matter. So um, you'll know you have either thrips or, or lace bug Lace bug is different than lace wing. Lace wings are good, lace bugs are bad. <laughs> so just to, just to uh, verify or, or classify those two. So this is what a thrips looks like. Um, this is an immature stage of a thrips. So again, they look like the adults, so they're, they are incomplete metamorphosis. And uh, thrips are, they, they're tough, they'll get all over. Um, this is just some thrips damage you can see. They will change the, the way the plant grows. Um, they get into the into the um, the flower bud. If you look in there, you can start seeing little things moving around, and those are going to be thrips. Um, and then you'll get you'll see you'll you can see thrips within with your with the naked eye. So you can see all these little uh, yellowy color. These are all immature stages of thrips. This is the adult stage of thrips because remember they have the wings. So moving on to chinch bugs. So. This is one of our last ones. Chinch bugs are not on our plants, but they get in our lawn, especially if you have St. Augustine. So um, this is one that every year I get calls about and um, you get this very, um, uh, it, starts to, it starts in small round spots. And what they're doing is they're feeding on the, 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 the perimeter of that lawn. Everything inside that, that, that spot Right? So if this started out as one little circle, sort of like here, started as a circle, the stuff inside that circle basically is dead. And now they're starting to move out. And so then they hop over and they're more like the circular type pattern with chinch bugs, right? So um, chinch bugs damage appears mainly in um, first in hot 
water stressed sunny areas of your lawn right so they get full sun um, water stressed right and the other thing is thatch buildup. If you have St. Augustine lawn and um, mulching is good, but sometimes you mulch and mulch and mulch and you get this big thatch buildup, right? So that's the area between that top, that top um, runner and the, and the actual top of the, the, uh, um, the soil. They love to live in that area because it stays nice and cool and warm and um, protective for them. So thatch buildup and stress lawns are more susceptible to thins to, to chinch bugs. So um, chinch bugs are tough to control, but there's a couple of um, beneficial insects that look very similar to chinch bugs that are actually uh, biological controls, right? They're the natural enemies. And those are a minute pirate bug and big-eyed bug. We'll see a, a picture of a big-eyed bug later. But Again, these are um, immature, I mean, I'm sorry, these are um, incomplete metamorphosis. This is an adult chinch bug. This is kind of that last nymph stage, right? Because it has wing buds, right? Those aren't quite wings yet, but the next time it molts, those are gonna be a full set of wings. And these are just probably ones that just hatched out of the egg. They're, they're kind of that orange, orangey red color with a straight line, but they do look like the adult, they're just, smaller versions of them. Okay, so we just covered all of those, the, the general ones that you're gonna see in your, your landscape of the uh, piercing sucking insects. Now we'll move on to chewing. This is pretty quick because the chewing ones we don't have to be as concerned about because although aesthetically they look bad, they make your plants look bad, but they do not transmit, transmit any diseases or any viruses. So chewing insects basically just chew. They can defoliate your plant, but your plant's gonna come back. But just know that you're not gonna get any diseases from these insects. So these are things, chewing nut parts are things like caterpillars, leaf miner, um, mole crickets, and then our grasshoppers, right? Um, uh, caterpillars, there's a really good biological spray you can use against caterpillars. Please don't do them against your butterflies. <laughs> but if you have things like army worms, any type of, of the army worm um, category, especially on your vegetables, you can use um, Bacillus and Thuringiensis. I can never say this right, right. So BT, Bacillus Thuringiensis, <laughs> plus it's the end of the program. Um, so those work really well. It's a bacteria that actually gets on um, or, or gets on the leaf the caterpillar, as it's eating, ingests it, and then it basically blows up the caterpillar from the inside. So BT is a really, really good bi uh, biological to use. So um, one of the really common caterpillars around here is the oleander caterpillar. Now, oleander is its host, meaning that's the plant it likes to eat, or, you know, like the host plant for a monarch butterfly is milkweed, right? but milkweed is the only thing, it's the only host plant to the monarch caterpillar, where the oleander caterpillar also eats desert rose. So um, know that it can defoliate your oleander, but your oleander is gonna come back. Um, young stages of this caterpillar, they're really, really tiny. They're gonna, um, it's called skeletonize the leaf, so it's gonna basically eat the leaf tissue out of the middle and so it gives kind of a window painting you'll see all the veins left in the leaf but as that grows and they grow very quickly this caterpillar is then going to eat the entire leaf except the vein it's going to leave that vein and we know that oleander is got a toxin in it so this um, caterpillar actually actually sequesters that toxin um, so it becomes toxic itself itself so not a lot of animals are gonna eat this caterpillar because they know it's toxic to them and they're not tempted to eat it. So this coloration makes, makes other things know, you know, you're not gonna wanna eat me. The oleander moth is, is the polka dotted moth and it is a pollinator. So um, just so you know, oleander caterpillars do have beneficial um, adult stages. This is the snow, snow bush spanworm. Now, this is another one. We'll decimate your snow bush. Every single leaf will be gone. They're voracious. They'll eat it down to the ground, but your snow bush will recover unless it gets eaten over and over and over again. 
So I would recommend if you love snow bush, don't put them all in the clump, kind of put them out throughout your landscaping so that maybe that caterpillar is not going to move or that the, the moth is not going to move on to those other bushes, right? It's going to stay in one area, but you're going to have snow bush in other areas. Um, it's the white tipped black moth is it's, is it's um, the adult stage. So um, uh, they only feed on snow bush, so it is their host. So if you don't want the, the, uh, this caterpillar around, I would suggest that you plant something other than, than snow bush because they are going to find it and they are going to eat it up. But um, it is a really common, uh, it is a really common um, plant in, uh, in a lot of uh, landscapes. So, you know, you're going you're gonna to spread the misery. So <laughs> that's kind of a, when, when a good way to think of it, I guess. So um, the serpentine leaf miner. So this is an interesting way. It is a chewing, it has a chewing mouth part, but this is a really, really tiny fly, right? So the landscape leaf miner is a fly. The vegetable leaf miner is actually a moth but they both do the same thing. So this fly takes and pierces, uh, pierces the um, plant tissue. That egg hatches out in between the tissue and then it mines through that leaf tissue. So contact insecticides like insecticidal soap is not gonna help with these guys because it's never gonna come in contact because it's between the leaf tissue. This is what you're gonna see with the leaf miner is this real, this is a serpentine leaf miner, so it gives you this really kind of crazy pattern. Once this larval has finished, larval stage has finished eating, it's going to pupate, it's going to pop out of that leaf, it's going to fall to the ground, and it's going to pupate in the soil. Once that pu pupal stage is over, it's going to emerge as an adult fly. This is really easy to control um, because one, they don't really, it doesn't, it it, it stops it from photosynthesizing to a point, but the rest of this leaf is okay, right? This is ready to pop out. So you still have, you know, probably half this leaf is still photosynthesizing, right? So you haven't killed the leaf, you haven't killed the plant. If it bothers you aesthetically, you can just pick that leaf off and throw it away. Especially if this larval uh, stage is still in the leaf, you can see it in the leaf you know that if you bag that and throw it away, you've gotten rid of that because it can never, you know, it now can't become an adult because that, lar that, that larvae is still in the leaf and you've thrown it away. So once, you know, once you see a hole and you don't see a larvae, it's no use picking that leaf off because that leaf is still photosynthesizing, right? So <clears throat> now onto the grasshoppers. Now, um, this is a lover grasshopper. So this guy, <laughs> Thank goodness, um, only one generation a year. This is one of the, those few insects that actually gets to be about three inches long. The first time I saw this grasshopper was in Louisiana. Um, in Louisiana, they call them uh, devil's ponies and they are huge. I had no idea what they were. It scared me to death to see this huge grasshopper. So the nymphs hatch out in about February, March and they become adults. They emerge as adults around April, May. So we've already had our big big flush of, of lovers this year. Um, they love any, any plants in the lily orchid um, variety of plants, right? And they will mow them down to the ground. The thing about the, the, these lovers is they have really tiny wings. So they don't fly, they can't fly, they can't carry that big body. And for, for uh, insect this size, they have pretty, pretty weak legs, right? They have jumping legs, but those, they, they can't jump very far. They can jump a little bit, but not like a, a tr you know, a typical grasshopper, like a Katie did or that. So um, these guys basically walk. So you'll see them walking across. This is actually the nymphal stage of, of the grasshopper. And a lot of people think they're actually a whole different grasshopper because they look so different. But as you can tell, remember I talked about wing buds. The nymph stages have wing buds. So this has a wing bud. Most of these are black. Um, some of them can be that orange coloration, but the most part, they're black with this yellow line down their, down their um, dorsal um, side. But as they mature and they molt, they start looking more like the adult. And then once they're adult, you'll see these, this, these full sets of wings. Um, control of these is basically stepping on them. It's really hard to control them. So mole cricket is our last one that we're going to talk about, as all, and these are lawn pests, right? These three species out here in Florida are all native. So we have the short-winged mole cricket, we have the tawny mole cricket, and we have 
the, the southern mole cricket. So mole crickets, they're, they have a different pattern. So um, they, they do tunneling, right? And you can see these tunnels in your, in your lawn. And then because they tunnel, they don't go out this way. You know, we talked about how chinch bugs go out this way. These go kind of more along the line of that runner because they eat at the base of, of the, uh, the um, they eat the roots. So they're running around the runner, uh, down the runner on the roots. So you're gonna get more of these like longitudinal or long lines looking. Um, it will eventually kind of go all together because they've killed the whole area. But um, the males come out of their burrows at night and they call to the females. And so they draw the females in. Any insect, um, especially mole crickets and um, things like beetles, um, termites, they tend to do their reproduction at night and they call it night. They're attracted to light. So if you turn off your, your light, especially during their seasons where they're, they're, they're mating, their reproductive seasons, um, if you turn off your light, your, any light, like something that comes through the window, shut your blinds, um, your, if you have floodlights out back, if you ha leave your, your porch light on, turn those off or change them to a different color, change them to a yellow or an orange, and you will minimize the number of insects that you're drawing in, right? And when you draw them in, like especially with beetles, they're gonna reproduce and they're gonna lay their eggs right there. So they're gonna re they're gonna, you're gonna have more of a problem around light sources with insects that go in the ground. So we've talked about our chewing sucking insects. We've talked about our, our, uh, our piercing, our chewing insects and our piercing sucking insects. Now we'll go on to our beneficials. I know we're getting close here. So um, let's talk about beneficials. So this is, this is a green lace. This is a green lace wing. This is a good guy. Remember I said the lace bug is bad. So um, I want to ask you guys a question. So you don't have to answer it, and I'm not asking you to answer it, but I want you to be honest with yourself. If you saw any of these insects in your landscape, would you think they were bad insects and would you treat for them? Now I say that because um, these are all beneficial insects. So here we go. Here is a lady, lady beetle larvae, so a ladybug. This one, remember when we looked at the mealybug, this looks very similar to a mealybug. But what this is, this is called a mealybug destroyer. This is a ladybug. So this is the immature stage of the ladybug. So all these three are immature stages of good bugs. Um, this guy here is called a lacewing. So that green lacewing I just showed you at that last slide, this is what its larval stage looks like. Very voracious. These three are incredible. Probably the two ladybugs and lacewings are probably the two best um, natural predators to have in your, your landscape. Now this is the big-eyed bug. Remember that picture of that chinch bug? Looks very, very similar. These do have big eyes, but if you're looking at it and you're not sure what you're looking at, you would think that this was a chinch bug because it's gonna also be in your, in your lawn because it eats chinch bugs. The minute pirate bug looks very similar to this. It's just got a smaller head. This is an assassin bug. So you see this proboscis here. So this is a stylet. Um, this will, it's a, it's a uh, generalist predator, so it's going to eat anything that it comes across. And then this is a stink bug. Um, we think about stink bug as being bad, but um, the way you think about like the, how to kind of, as a general, you know, when I'm talking about the generalizations, in a general sense, think of them as having armor, stink bugs with armor, right? So their exoskeleton and armor has points, right? Kind of like your, your arrow. So armor has points, good stink bugs have points. So if you see this point, you're probably gonna have a good stink bug. If this is more of a rounded corner, that's probably gonna be a bad stink bug. Again, that's a generalization, but you know, it's something that you can, you can say, Yes, you know, I think that's a good guy, so I'm not going to kill it. IDing the pest. So pest identification, proper pest identification is your first step into knowing whether you have to treat for something or not. So proper identification is part of an integrated pest management uh, program or, or, or uh, system. And um, it's really important to know what you're treating. I had a guy last year that came in he sprayed a hedge, 
he literally had, I think he said a 60 foot hedge, um, sprayed it until the leaves fell off because he was using biological. So he's like, I was spraying it with soaps and oils and, it, and, uh, and so, you know, and, insecticidal neem oils. But um, he goes, but all my leaves fell off. What he ended up having, he had this guy. So his entire hedge, he killed and he killed all of those ladybugs, right? Their larval stage. So knowing what you have is really important. So when you think about pollinators um, or, or beneficial insects, you can kind of put them into insect buckets. So we have our pollinators, that's kind of our first bucket. So these insects pollinate our crops, both our vegetable crops and our, our vegetable and fruit, as well as our, um, our uh, flowers, right? We rely on them as for our food, um, as well as the flowers in our backyard. One third of our, our every one of three bites of your food comes from a pollinator, right? And that would be a honeybee. So protecting honeybees especially is really, really important. But other pollinators besides honeybees are butterflies, moths and flies, some beetles. Um, so we have quite a, quite a few pollinators. Our next one are detritivores, our decomposers. Now this is a millipede. Again, it's not an insect, it's an arthropod, but it's, um, it's a really good decomposers. Some of our detritivores, so these are things that break down dead organic matter, really important for, uh, you know, uh, for recycling that, that good organic matter back into the, uh, into the environment. So some of these are cockroaches, um, beetles, millipedes, like I showed you. Termites are also good uh, detritivores to an extent, and dung beetles, so they're in our, the beetle family. The next one are predators. So when we say predators, those are kind of our generalists, right? So these are going to eat anything that kind of comes along, especially things like praying mantids. Um, so you're going to catch them like he's eating a fly. This, um, this could be actually be a good fly, um, but they keep each other in check, right? You may see him eating a ladybug, but you know, that's nature. <laughs> that's what happens. Um, so these are all good guys. Other generalists are things like uh, dragonflies and spiders. Spiders are really good. All spiders are good. I know you don't want them in your house, so if you find them in your house, please try to get them outside. But all spiders eat insects, so all spiders are good. And then we have this, this interesting bucket called parasitoids. So these are a very specialized group of ben beneficial insects. Um, these are kind of the things that you know, are, are kind of nightmares are made of. And a lot of, you know, I've seen, I've seen, um, things on TV where they say they use insects as their, their, um, their source of their, when they're making up alien creatures. So um, parasitoids, there are two different types of parasitoids. We have parasitoids that actually parasitize an insect. So those are, I, I talked about the mummy aphids. So this is an emerging uh, parasitoid. So this is a mummified uh, aphid. So this is emerging, right? So it's gonna go on to reproduce and parasitize other aphids. And then we have our ones that paralyze. A lot of, most of our parasitoids are wasps. And the, our bigger ones like our yellow jackets, they're the ones that, that are um, ground, uh, they live in the ground, right? Um, they paralyze mainly caterpillars and then they carry them back alive to their nest and then they feed them to their young as soon as those eggs hatch out. So those are the two different types of parasitoids, really important. These guys are really, really tiny. So this is kind of just an uh, overview um, of all of the beneficial insects that we have. So there's a lot of beneficials that are in our, in our landscape. So it's important if you think you need to go spray, you wanna make sure you look around and if you see any of these, you could kind of, unless that, that infestation is like, you know, beyond, <laughs> beyond having the beneficials take care of it. Um, if you do have beneficials, give them their chance to work, right? They're gonna take a little bit longer to work, but overall you're gonna have a better outcome, a long-term, um, you're gonna have a long-term outcome versus uh, instantaneous gratification of ki killing those insects in immediately, those pest insects. So um, again, these are all different types of lady beetle larvae. So important to know that this dinosaur looking creature is actually a good bug and um, it's actually quite voracious. Um, a large adult lady, lady beetle can eat about 60 aphids a day, a day. <laughs> and these lar the larval stage eats about 
about 25 a day. But in a lifetime, a ladybug lifetime, from this larval stage to her adult stage, she can eat up to 5,000 aphids. So each ladybug can eat up to 5,000 aphids. So really important. So really, really important to know not to kill when you see these kind of, kind of insects around. So, so here's uh, the mealybug destroyer, and it's eating all of these aphids. So the thing about these, you can buy these. Um, you want to try to get ones that are already in your landscape, but you can buy these. You can find them at any big box store or most big box stores, nurseries. You can order them online. But remember, here's the thing about these. If you are, if you are adding them to your landscape, when you get them, keep them in a cool place, which is kind of like in the refrigerator. You're going to get them, if you order them online, you're going to get them in a box. Keep them in a cool spot. So in the refrigerator, don't freeze them, just at a cool temperatures, and then release them at night. Because what happens is these guys actually are, most of them are from California area, and they're, they're raised up, up in the hills. And so when they, they, they find them, what they're doing though is they're feeding lower down in the valleys, right? So they fly down the valleys to feed, and then they fly back up to the, up to the, um, up the hill to rest. So if you release them right when you get them, what they're going to do is they're going to fly away because that's, that's what's ingrained in them is they fly away. So if you keep them in a cool spot, you then release them at night, they know that they're just going to go and, and rest in that area until daylight, until it starts to warm up and, and, and get sunlight. And so when they, they wake up, basically, they're going to see their food sources right there, so they're not going to fly away, or most of them won't fly away. They'll stay put. So again, if you release them the minute you bring them home, <laughs> you're, going to be, um, you're going to be propagating your neighbor's yard with your, with your, uh, your newly purchased uh, beneficial ladybugs. So I just wanted to give you, uh, so this goes from, from basically the right to the left, and I just wanted to show you these are all complete metamorphosis, right? So they have this egg stage, they go into this larval stage, this is the pupa stage, and then this is the adult stage. So here we have our lacewing, there's a the brown and the green lacewing, and then we have two represent, representations of the lady, ladybug. We have a whole bunch of ladybugs here in Florida. Um, green lacewing, just to point out, they lay their eggs on stalks. So these are very, very delicate, um, and you will see them you, once you start looking, you'll start seeing these, but they lay them in stocks because this guy is so voracious that he will eat his siblings if they all hatch out at the same time on the leaf. He'll just go through, remember, generalists, so they're eating whatever they come across. So he will eat his, his siblings. So they lay them on the stalk so that they have time to escape and go find their actual true food source. Okay, praying mantis. Just wanted to throw this in. Awesome, guys sit and wait kind of predators, whatever comes along is what they eat. Um, they eat a lot of good bugs as well. So just know these are great to have in your, in your landscape, but they will eat everything. I just wanted to show you a quick thing about the, these are the predatory. So this is the parasitic versus a predatory moss, wasp. They're both considered kind of parasitic. Um, another type, so they either lay their eggs inside and they pupate from the inside out Right? They, these guys, um, when they're doing with the aphids, they emerge as an adult aphid. You see other ones that actually don't right away kill the caterpillar, and this, this is a, uh, a tomato hornworm. What they do is they eat the inside. This is, these are called gregarious um, egg casings. So all these eggs were inside. They all munched away at the inside of this caterpillar. And then they came out, and this is the pupil stage. So all of these are going to be wasps as soon as they come out of that pupa stage. They're going to be wasps. They're going to fly around. They're going to parasitize more um, caterpillars. So what's good is, you know, if you killed this at this point, if you tried to spray this, you would kill probably, what, 30 different parasitic wasps that are their beneficial insects. Because this guy's already a goner. He's already dead. So you do not want to do anything. You want to let this take its course and let those, those hatch out. Like here you see a couple of them actually have already hatched out. And these are the wasps that then par uh, paralyze and carry them back to the nest. Um, already talked about the aphid mummies. So you can see the all, they're all brown and they all have this hole at the end of their abdomen that they've already hatched out. So this is, this is something you want to see in your landscape. These are ones that I just took pictures up. So here's one that is 
has been parasitized, but it hasn't hatched yet. Here's one that you can see the parasitoid is inside the scale. This is a scale. It's inside the scale, and this is one that has just hatched out. So you see this hole, you know that that, that parasitoid has already hatched out. So this is, you know, this is just really cool, I think, to see. Spiders, I said, I'm not going to go over these, but all spiders are good. We have a plethora of spiders. I love this one, especially the green link spider. It's pretty small, beautiful sp spider. Um, not all spiders make webs, right? But all spiders eat insects. Um, just want to say, give beneficials a chance, right? It takes them a while to feed, but if you take away their food source, you're not going to have any beneficial um, beneficials in your, your landscape. So you want to keep some food around, right? You know, if you had no, no food in your, in your house, your kids wouldn't be around. <laughs> so they're, you know, they're going to go away. So um, make sure you leave a good amount of, 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 of pests, insects in your landscape to draw those, those good insects in so that they can take care of it on their own without you having to use any sort of, of um, chemical sprays on them. So a quick overview of IBM. I just want to say, so IPM, integrated pest management. So for me, IPM is a way of life, right? So IPM is a process for pest control that utilizes regular monitoring to determine if a treatment is necessary, right? And then at the end, you evaluate how effective it was. So the approach is to be proactive and to stop the pests in the first place, right? A small amount of infestation is good. A big infestation is not because then you've gone from being proactive to having to be reactive, which is kind of not the position you want to be in. It uses a combination of methods. So those methods help to decrease the pest population without using harsh chemicals and um, products that either harm the environment, harm wildlife, or harm us or our pets, right? And especially ones that harm beneficial insects. So I, using IPM really is the environmentally responsible way, responsible way to pest management. So um, in pest management, non-chemical methods are stressed and pesticides are used only as a last resort when everything else you've tried has failed, right? You've, you've already tried to trim it off. You've tried to get the beneficials in. You've in the, used those biological sprays or those you know, bio-rational sprays. Then you go, okay, I do have to use a conventional chemical. Your goal is for that to be the last thing you ever have to use. So um, IPM is what the overview is, is that you want to achieve this, this long-term goal of pest management, right? Um, quick uh, gratification, right, of killing that insect is great and all, but in the long term, it's not really helpful to you. So IPM, when we look at the IPM pyramid, um, this is just to be really quick. Remember the old food pyramid where on the bottom we had all our fruits and vegetables, those are, you want to use mostly those things. And at the very top were your fats and your oils. Well, you think about, that's the same thing you want to think about when you're looking at IPM. You want to start with prevention, be proactive, be preventative. You don't want to get to this point where you're doing, um, being reactive and you have to use intervention, right? So prevention, your cultural practices, right? Good mulching, good watering practices. Don't over fertilize. So those good cultural practices, mechanical use. When you see, start seeing something, see if you can trim it off. Can you hit it with a blast of water, right? Can you do those things that you don't need chemical intervention for? Then you go to your biological. Do you have biologicals? Do you have natural enemies in your, your, um, in your landscape? Um, can you buy some and put them in, you know, are you, if you have that option? Um, but then you get to the chemical. So when you get to the chemical, Biorationals first, right? Reduced risk pesticides, one that have less impact on you, on the environment. You want to do spot sprays. You want to do ones that have target insects, right? You don't want to, if you have one little area that you really want to treat, why are you going to treat your entire hedge, right? If you don't see any problem with that whole hedge and only that one area, just treat that one area. Treat it with things that are more contact, right? You don't really want to use systemics unless you have to. So um, that's where these, these conventional chemicals come in at the very end. If you do have a mass infestation, um, that's when you need to use conventionals or if you have to use conventionals, use them sparingly and only as a last, last resort. So pesticide is a last resort. 
if you're using pesticide, even birationals, anything you use, I'd say even things in your, in your house, even things that you take, right? Ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen, things like that. Read and follow the label instructions. It's really important. That label will tell you everything you need to know about that product. Um, but then also you know, need, as we talked about, accurate identification of the insect, right? Need to know that so that you know you're spraying a pest insect and not a beneficial insect. Use chemical sparingly, spot treat if you can, target pest. You don't wanna do a broad spectrum. That's gonna kill everything that it comes in contact with. Um, low impact first. Definitely avoid um, chemicals that are carcinogenic, uh, neurotoxin or endocrine disruptors. You probably, as an over-the-counter, don't have access to those anyway. Um, mostly those need to have a, um, a, you need a pesticide license for those. And always, always, always wear the indicated uh, personal protective equipment, your PPE that it says to use on the label, really important. So in the end, so, when you're looking at insects, remember they're really tiny. You can't walk by a plant and really go, oh, I think I have some white fly on that plant if you're just standing back. These things, hand lenses, I have one right here. I don't know if you can see it. Sometimes my background doesn't allow you to see it. Um, a hand lens is awesome. These are really cheap. This is like $1.50. Um, you can get better, a little bit better ones. This one's like $5. Um, and then any sort of identification books, right? These actually come from UFIFIS Extension Bookstore, not the UF Bookstore, but the Extension Bookstore. I'm not saying you have to buy these. You just buy whatever is local to you, right? Because I, sometimes I get people on here, last time I had somebody from Puerto Rico. So you want to get something that has insects that are in your region, right? We, these things in particular are going to have things that are in the Southeast region. So we know that we're going to see these things that are in these books are in our region. Really good, especially if you don't know what you're looking at, or you send me a picture of it. So if you don't know what it is, please send me a picture before, before you decide to especially spray anything. So I, I'm, I am always up for, and I will give you a quick response <laughs> on whether that's a good or a bad bug. Um, I'm just gonna, I have another program, my biorational program talks about all of these, but these are your least toxic options. So these are all things you can use that are those, those minimal risk pesticides that are considered biorationals. So your, your, your soaps and oils, um, diatomaceous earth, um, spinosad, um, so your bacteria, your microbials, and then your things like your vinegars, your, 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 your boric acids, those type of things. So in the end, I just want you to have this as a take home and a final thought. When we kill off our natural enemies of pests, we inherit their work, right? It takes longer for beneficials to recover from an insecticide spray. So if you kill off everything, just know that you're gonna, what's returning first are gonna be pest insects. And so you're gonna get caught on this hamster wheel. If you think pesticides are the way to go, you're gonna get caught on what's called, a, it's called a, a pesticide it's called a, a, a pesticide windmill. So you're gonna just keep going around and around. You're gonna have to spray, spray, spray. And then you're gonna have to hopefully eventually have those, those uh, repopulations of those beneficial insects. So with that, I wanna say thank you. And here is my, um, my direct contact information. I can get this out to you on a PDF, so don't worry about writing down anything, just listening to it.